you seated, uh, please. Every day, you can read or see in the TV or news, some, news somewhere about uh, Internet of Things, about intelligent machines, about robotics that should help our societies, that should help the people, that should produce uh, things easier and more accurately. But at the same time, you also read about fake news. You need about manipulation of the election in the United States. You read about break-ins into computers of the banks or your own computers. So every light has some shadow. And our today's speaker is here to tell you to remove the shadow and just have the light left. Uh, because Arthur Eckert, and I'm quoting now from the laudatio that the Royal Society has written about his accomplishments, and there are really only two sentences necessary. His invention of entanglement-based quantum cryptography in 1991 triggered an explosion of research efforts worldwide and continues to inspire new research directions. He has played a leading role in transforming quantum information science into a vibrant interdisciplinary field. Arthur is a professor of quantum physics at the Mathematical Institute in the University of Oxford. At the same time, Lee Kong Chan, Centennial Professor at the National University of Singapore and director of the Center for Quantum Technologies, the Croucher Foundation. And not surprisingly, he has received many awards for, that, for his accomplishments. In 1995, the Maxwell Medal and Prize by the Institute of Physics. In 2007, the Howard Hughes Medal by the Royal Society. And he's also the co-recipient of the 2004 European Descartes Prize, very highly recognized prize, I should say. And in 2016, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society. He's on top of this, a fellow of the Singapore National Academy of Sciences, and received in 2017 the Singapore Public Administration Medal in Silver. Well, Arthur, we are very happy to have you. you. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for those nice words. And it's my pleasure to be here. It's my actually second visit to OIST. I had the pleasure to talk about some of my work during my last visit. It was somewhat more technical, and today, um, I would like to tell you about a story, a story about uh, our quest for perfect security. So I would like to start with a historical background. I'm going to tell you how people thought about secure communication in the past, how they think about it today, and what will happen most likely. You know, the, to make predictions, especially about the future, is always very difficult, but, but uh, I will try to speculate a little bit about what can happen in the future. And, and the story is interesting because at some point into this crypto world, which was a domain of people doing linguistics, doing mathematics, at some point physicists crept in and, uh, and somehow started playing increasingly more important role, not only just at the hardware, side, but also on the side of uh, concepts and ideas for secure communication. So it's, it's going to be a very simple introduction to crypto, cryptography, cryptology. Uh, doesn't require too much mathematics, but uh, if at any point you have some questions, I'm, I don't mind if you interrupt. I, I can be more technical at any point if you wish me to do so. Um, so here's the outline of the talk. I mean, just the, the question that I want to address. Is there a perfect method for secure communication? Is there such a thing like a perfect cipher? And uh, by you know, leading you to um, the story about the paper or, or different ways of encryption, I will talk about uh, what is required for perfect security in this case. I'll talk about something that is called the key distribution. I'll define what is this. It's kind of like, you know, the holy grail of cryptography. If you can find a good way of distributing keys, and I'm going to define what it is, then uh, you're really in business because that's something what uh, people in secure communication would like to do. Then I'll just uh, tell you how quantum physics entered in this, into this game. 
and then uh, it will become more and more wacky at the end of my talk. I will just almost go ballistic and tell you that at some point even the issues, philosophical issues such like the perception of reality may have some impact on the perception of security and uh, I don't know whether I'll get paranoid at the end, but you know the idea is that the latest research goes even as far as asking questions. Okay, can we have security if we don't have, and you know if there's no free will and so on and so forth. So I don't go, I don't go into into details of that, but I'll give you some taste of what uh, people working at the frontier of security are talking about. So that's that's the plan. But I can deviate from this plan at any point if you if you ask any questions and ask me to do something else. So when I talk about uh, secure communication, I want you to have in mind this particular scenario. Well, today, cryptography is about all kinds of different scenarios. It's about uh, signatures, it's about authentication, it's about uh, uh, secure computation. So th I'm not going to touch those. I want to just focus on one very simple scenario. And this is what I would like you to have in mind. So imagine that you have two individuals, they're two good guys, Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob want to communicate with each other. But there may be a third character, an eavesdropper, quite often called Eve. And uh, Eve would like to intercept messages that Alice and Bob communicate, I mean, Alice, basically eavesdropper would like to read what Alice and Bob are trying to tell to each other. And the, the big question is, can Alice and Bob design a system which will exclude eavesdropper from this game? So we are looking for a system that would allow them to have perfect security in their communication. If we go into the history, the, 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 that kind of scenario uh, existed since time immemorial, really. So people, as soon as people invented writing, they wanted to protect information in some cases. And with the invention of alphabet, and it's interesting that, that it is mostly in the sort of, uh, you know, as soon as Phoenicians came up with a set of 30 characters, it was much easier as compared to, say, the huge number of the Chinese characters that are used for, for communication in China. So it's probably not surprising that the origin of secure communication or cryptography as we know it today goes back into uh, Mediterranean cultures and uh, nation civilization in that part of the world. And basically, you know, once you have a finite number of characters, you can play with them. And if you have the alphabet, what you can do with the alphabet? You can permute letters in the message, and this way you can, you can scramble it a little bit, or you can do the substitutions. So you can just, for each letter in the alphabet, you can substitute another character or another symbol. Uh, and we know that permutations were used for secure communication by ancient Greeks. And they came up with the first device called Skittily. I'll show you in a moment how it looks like. And that goes roughly to 400 BC. And uh, when it comes to substitution ciphers, where you substitute one character for another, um, allegedly Julius Caesar used it for communication between different military commanders. And uh, you know, that goes roughly to 50 BC. Um, and uh, needless to say, people use both permutations and substitutions. Uh, but it's actually quite interesting to look at the, the first device that was used for secure communication. So this is actually how permutation of characters were implemented. So there was a device called Skittily. So in nation Sparta, if you want to send, a, imagine two military commanders, and if one of them wants to send a message to another, the guy would have a wooden button of a certain diameter, then would take a piece of parchment and wrap it around the, the wooden button, and then, you write the message lengthwise, so, you know, attack tomorrow. And then, then what you do, you just unwrap this parchment, so it looks like, like this piece of uh, here, and you see letter A is still letter A, and letter T is still letter T, but it's the position of those letters is somehow permuted, right? So they, uh, the letters retain the character, but the placement of the letter in, in here, modulo the rotation is... is uh, is in a different location. So it looks pretty scrambled. So you give this parchment to a courier who will just carry it to another military commander. 
and the guy on the receiving side would have a wooden button of the same diameter. So it would take the parchment, wrap it around, and the message would reappear. So this is actually the first device that we know about that used or implemented permutation of characters for secure communication. So Skittily, ancient Greeks, the first method of communication. Very simple, right? Nonetheless, it kind of worked, uh, as long as we believe historians that it was used by the Greeks for some period of time. Now, Julius Caesar had another idea, and that's an example of a substitution cipher. So what he did, he would just take a Roman alphabet, and then would just write a, another Roman alphabet, you know, another sequence of letters, shifted by three characters to the left, and then you append this A, B, C to the end of... Uh, of, of the shifted alphabet, and then you generate the substitution rule. The rule is simple. Say, A, for A in your message, substitute D, for B, substitute E, for C, substitute F, and so on and so forth. So then you encrypt the message that we saw before by the substitution rule. So you can see that you know, for A, we substituted D as required for T, we have W, for T we have W again, for A we have D again, and so on and so forth. So, so this is a very simple substitution cipher. Again, a simple, very simple indeed, but uh, apparently used with a certain degree of success during the Roman times. Now, you may ask, you know, okay, how secure are this kind of ciphers? Well, you may say, okay, well, the substitution, as long as, you know, there are not so many shift generated substitutions, you know, the, the pretty much as many as characters, about 30 of them. So you can try all 30 and you can break the cipher. Uh, the answer is yes, but you know, you can also think about other substitutions that are not necessarily generated by the shift of the alphabet. And if you consider the whole class of the substitution, then there are zillions of them, literally like 10 to the 26, which is a huge number, and you cannot try them all. So can we still break ciphers of that kind? Of that kind, I mean, they call monoalphabetic ciphers, that you have one-to-one -one substitution for each character, for each letter in the alphabet, you have the same symbol that you put into the cryptogram. Well, the answer is yes, actually, it's quite easy to break that kind of ciphers. Everyone can do it today, and that's based on statistical analysis of the frequency of different characters in the cryptogram. What does it mean? You, you see, any natural language is, doesn't offer random, you know, in the natural language, you don't have a random sequence of characters appearing in a written text. So if you take English, for example, or even pretty much any Indo-European language, then a typical frequency would be such that, say, the letter E is the most frequent letter, followed by T, followed by A, and certain sequences of letters, like TH, is very common, and so on and so forth. So what do you do? Um, when you see a cryptogram and you know that it was encrypted by a simple one-to-one -one substitution, you look for the most frequent character in the cryptogram. And then you assume that the most frequent character is the letter E. And then the second most frequent, and you assume that it's the letter T, and so on and so forth. And very quickly, you just fill the gaps. So it's just very easy to do it, and uh, regardless of the substitution you use. Uh, and so, you know, this method, by the way, was uh, first discovered by or proposed by uh, an Arab or slash Persian scholar, Al-Kindi, who's known as the philosopher of the Arabs in the ninth century. So you see, from Julius Caesar till the ninth century, it took people a while to figure out how to do it. But that happened during the golden period of uh, uh, Islam flourish at the time. So he worked in what is today Baghdad, and, um, and you know, it's amazing insight uh, how to break those uh, monoalphabetic ciphers. So, okay, monoalphabetic ciphers can be broken. What do we have? Do we have anything better than that? So the next thing after monoalphabetic ciphers, uh, when you think about it, what could be the next thing to do if monoalphabetic ciphers are very simple to break by statistical analysis? Um, well, the next thing you can think about, of course, is what is called polyalphabetic ciphers. Instead of one-to-one -one substitution, why don't we just use one-to-many substitution? And, uh, and again, you know, you have to trust historians here because many people claim 
uh, to come up with this idea, and probably many people had this idea independently in the past. Um, so the idea of invention is attributed, as, as you can see, to many people, but usually most historians point to a guy called Leone Battista Alberti. He was an Italian man of the Italian architect, so uh, of, the Ital of the Renaissance period, and so probably most of you who are interested in uh, Renaissance or history would come across this name, not as a crypto person, but as a, as a famous Italian architect of that period. So anyway, so, Alberti had this idea that maybe, you know, one way to do encryption would be to use a mechanical device for substitution. And he proposed to use two, um, two concentric disks, um, known as an Alberti encryption disk, where you can have two disks with the alphabets written on the perimeter of the disk, and then you can have the substitution rule depending on the uh, relative orientation or rotation of those two disks. So now, he then suggested that, of course, this can be used for monoalphabetic ciphers, for a simple shift cipher, but he suggested the following idea. Actually, don't use just one substitution, but a few substitutions. For example, use three different substitutions as you go along. For different character, choose a different substitution, and then, you know, keep on repeating this. Uh, so for example, for the first character in the message, shift the alphabet by seven. For the second character, shift the alphabet by 14. So different substitution rule. For the third character, shift by 19. And then for the fourth character, go back to seven and repeat it. So every third letter will be encrypted with the same substitution rule, but at least you have three different substitutions rule in this particular case. So as you go through the message, it's not going to be the case that, say, the letter A is always substituted by, say, some character. It really depends where in the message letter A is placed. So, so it can be encrypted in two different ways, or three different ways, because we have three different substitution rules in this particular case. So you can see that, for example, using this sub sequence of substitutions, the plain text such as cell um, goes into this cryptogram. And the interesting thing to notice is that the letter L now is, appears encrypted in, in two different ways. So the statistical analysis, if you look at the cryptogram, you kind of wash out a little bit the pattern of the language. So it's not one-to-one -one anymore. It doesn't reveal the frequency of characters in the same way. It still has a statistical pattern, but it's much more difficult to, to pick it up. And the person who came, so you see, you know, again, Alberti came up with this idea of polyalphabetic ciphers and this mechanical device for encrypting in the 15th century, and it took people a while. Actually, early 19th century, Charles Babbage came up with a systematic way of cracking polyalphabetic ciphers. It was a few centuries, and people came up with all kinds of ingenious way of using polyalphabetic ciphers. And the whole idea of this Alberti disk, which he used to shift um, the characters by, by a certain number, became more and more elaborate as people built, started building electromechanical devices for encryption. So Alberti disk gave um, birth to what is called a, a rotor in, in more complex machines, and perhaps the most famous one that implemented much more complicated polyalphabetic cipher was the one that was used for the Enigma machine. The Enigma machine itself was, was uh, designed by a Dutch engineer, Arthur Schwerbius, and uh, was accepted as a major source of uh, crypto communication during World War II uh, by, uh, by the Germans. And was, uh, if you think Alan Turing cracked it, then you are wrong, actually, because it, you know, um, it was cracked by this guy, Marian Rejewski, from the Polish Bureau of Ciphers first, and then the Poles passed the information how to do it. Um, to, um, to the British and the French, who then staged the whole effort to uh, crack even more complicated Enigma ciphers, especially the, you know, the, the, critical, the, the, the contribution of Turing was when the Enigma was made more complicated by adding one extra rotor, um, that Turing had to come up with a new way of cracking it. But anyway, so the message is beautiful idea. Enigma was a really a, a very interesting machine, you know. 
Nonetheless, sooner or later, the, so there's an ingenious way of encoding, and sooner or later you have another person who comes with another ingenious idea to, to break it. So the question is, do we have such a thing like a perfect cipher? Can we guarantee at some point that the human ingenuity can create a cipher that no one can break? Can we prove it? Uh, you see, so far the history teaches us a lesson that is, uh, doesn't work like this, you know. You come up with the idea, someone else, you know, monoalphabetic cipher, you have Alkindi, polyalphabetic cipher, you have Babbage, you know, very complicated polyalphabetic cipher, they're all brilliant guys who can use all kinds of mathematical techniques. Rayevsky, by the way, used um, uh, group theory, you know, it's a, if, you, if you ever end up teaching group theory or permutations, uh, group of permutations, actually, it's, it's very nice to illustrate it with uh, applications to code breaking. So, is there such a thing like a perfect cipher? Well, the answer is actually yes. And here is, I can, I can show you how it looks like. It's called one-time path, and it works like this. So, you, you have a message which you write in the binary alphabet. It's not encryption. Or, you know, it's just you pick up an ASCII code or whatever, translate your letters into a sequence of zeros and ones, everyone knows what it is. And, and you know, you, if you Alice and you want to send it to Bob, you take this romantic message in gray, and, uh, and, then, and then she has something that is uh, called a cryptographic key. That is a sequence of zeros and ones that is truly random. It's just, it just completely random without any pattern. And, I'm not going to go into details. What does it mean truly random? But there's no statistical pattern for anyone to discover in this red sequence of zeros and one. And what Alice is going to do, she's going to take the, the message and she's going to add it bit by bit to the key. So for example, going from the right to the left, zero to plus zero gives you zero, zero plus one gives you one, one plus zero gives you one. But the rule is that one plus one is equal to zero. That's the only different thing in the binary addition. And this way you generate the cryptogram. So the cryptogram, the thing in the green here, is encrypted because somehow it inherited the randomness from the key. The plain text has a, you know, if you look at the frequencies of zeros and one, or groups of zeros and one, it has a frequency of the natural language, so it's a plain text. So if you do statistical analysis on the first one, on the gray thing, you will find what it is. Um, but the key is just random. So if you take something that is meaningful and add to this noise, complete noise, you get the noisy stuff. This noise basically is transferred to the cryptogram. So the cryptogram doesn't have any pattern whatsoever. And so Alice sends this cryptogram over any unprotected channel. So it could be like a broadcasting. She can say to everyone, you know, this, to Bob. And Bob receives the cryptogram, and he picks up the key, the identical set of sequence of zeros and ones that Alice has, and then performs the same addition, same binary addition. So he takes the noisy cryptogram, adds the noise from the key, and gets the message. So you subtract this noise. Now, Claude Shannon, the founder of information theory, managed to prove that under the following condition, as long the, this system, known one-time path, is absolutely secure as long as the key is truly random, truly secret, only known to Alice and Bob, as long as the message and never reused. So once you use it, you throw it away in a secure way. Now, so, so he said, well, then, then it's perfect. There's just, nobody can break it. Well, so, you know, that's the answer. We do have a perfect cipher, but, but that's only like the beginning of my talk. So why, why is this not a good solution? There's a problem with this scheme, right? And I, I, I'm sure you can guess what the problem is. What do you think is the problem? Yes, so I can hear distribution, I can hear different voices, but yes, you are, you, are, you are getting it right. So the problem is that we have to make sure that the key is continuously distributed to Alice and Bob, because remember, once you use it, it's not good anymore. If you make these mistakes, and in fact, the Russians made this mistake at some point, and the Americans 
picked it up on this mistake and started reading those um, uh, allegedly secure one-time paths uh, because the Soviets didn't have ability to replace the keys and they decided to reuse some of the keys and, and blah, blah, blah. There is a story to it. So you can, you're not supposed to be making this kind of mistakes. So you'd better use key only once and, uh, and that's it. But if, if this is the case, then you have to distribute this key all the time in a secure way. And this is known as the key distribution problem. So, so once you find a way to give identical random sequences of zeros and one to two different users, you solve the problem of secure communication. But then we turn, you know, we, we translated one problem into another. Can we, can we then generate keys or, tr or distribute keys to, to different users in a secure way, in a secure fashion? And this, this was like the holy grail of cryptography. So if you want to just, you know, impress your friends in cyber security and just you can talk, you know, oh, the key distribution is an issue, right? just how do we handle this? And so the question is, yeah, how do we handle the key distribution? How do we solve the key distribution problem? Um, the, well, there are two basically ways of solving key distribution problem. One is known under the label public key distribution. And uh, this is, you may not know the, the language, the technicalities, but you kind of use it on, almost on a daily basis because public key crypto systems are used to protect uh, uh, your credit card transactions on the internet and all kinds of other things. So, so this is a beautiful mathematical invention um, that was discovered independently in the United Kingdom and also in, in the United States. And it's security... Is it avoids the key distribution in a clever way. I'll just give you one transparency explaining how it works roughly without going to mathematical things. It's mathematically is beautiful. It goes into nice areas of mathematics like number theory and the like. And, uh, but the problem is we cannot prove that those systems are secure. If you ask computer scientists or cryptologists to provide you with a proof, most of them say, you know, all we can tell you is that there are some difficult problems in mathematics that we know how to solve them, but extremely time consuming for computers. And we use them for the security purposes, but we never know whether those problems are really difficult, whether they will always be difficult, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's just not really a mathematical proof that those things are secure. They're based on the fact, you know, many people tried and nobody knows how to do certain mathematical operations in an efficient way. So we assume that for all practical purposes, those systems are secure. But we also know that most of them, the most popular one that we use today, are not going to be secure if we have quantum technology. So you know, there's this field of quantum computing. And if we build a quantum computer, then public key crypto system, most public key crypto system that we know today will not be secure. So they can be broken by machines that operate in a slightly different way than the classical computers operate. So that's not a good sign. So that, that is a big problem. And, and lots of work now is going on in this area, trying to find public key crypto systems that are immune to quantum technology, to attack coming from quantum computers. But you know, in some sense, what quantum takes away, quantum gives back, because there's also an area called quantum cryptography, which allows you to distribute the key using certain quantum phenomena in such a way that it's immune to quantum attacks. So, so quantum physics comes to the rescue. And I will be mostly talking about the second solution because you know, until we find something that uh, will be good for the public key cryptography, that, you know, that's, we, we, we cannot claim that those systems are absolutely secure. So to, to, this is like one slide explaining the concept of public key crypto systems. So it works roughly like this. It's a mechanical analog. Imagine now that I built a, a, a box, a safe box, which has two keys. One key that is good for locking the box and another key that is good for unlocking the box. So the thing is though that the locking key is only good for locking, it's not good for unlocking. And the unlocking key is good for unlocking the box, but you cannot use it to lock the box. So we separate the roles for locking and unlocking. So the locking key is also known as the public key. The unlocking key 
is known as a private key. So we have two different keys now. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you those boxes. Though of course, you know, they're not mechanical boxes. They're some kind of mathematical algorithm. And everyone can actually get such a mechanical box with a public key, the locking key attached to it. In practice, what it means is that my, my public key, the locking key, is known to everyone. So you can look it up almost like in telephone directory and see what it is. And you can then use this sequence of numbers to lock messages that are sent to me. So the way, it, you know, using this mechanical analogy, you can just take the box, it's open, write the message, put the message inside, put the lid down, use the locking key, the public key, to lock the box and send it to me. The thing is, you know, if you write a message and lock it, that's it. You cannot unlock it. With a, so if you made a mistake, yeah, tough luck. You cannot correct it, so you have to send another message to me or something else. And then, you know, the message comes to me, and I use the private key that is private. I never share it with anyone. It's just personal thing. And I just use it to unlock the box. And that's how it works. So everyone can have two pairs of keys. Each of you will have a one public key. It will be known to everyone. And each of you will have a private key that is only known to you. And the messages are circulated in such a way that uh, I can encrypt messages with your public key. I can pick up any one of you as a potential recipient of my message, look, your, look up your public key, write the message, log with the public key, and only that person can read it because that person would have the private key to unlock the message. Now, the obvious question to ask now is, you say, okay, everyone knows this mathematical algorithm. There are two numbers. One is called public key. The other one is called private key. Everyone knows about the public key. So can you deduce the private key from the public key? So that's the question, right? And the answer is yes. So how is it secure? Well, yes, but, dot, dot, dot. The but is that you can, in principle, figure out what is the private key, knowing the public key and knowing the method of encryption, but it's usually very time consuming. So the, if you give this problem to a computer, that uh, the amount of resources that are, be it time or memory, that are used is, is huge. So in fact, you know, in some cases you don't want to, you know that you can, in some mathematical problems are of that kind. So, so, so the most popular ciphers of that kind are based on the difficulty of factoring. Which means this, that if I give you a number and ask you to find prime factors of this number. So say, for example, I give you number 15, 1, 5. Then you say immediately 3 times 5. 3 is prime, 5 is prime, 3 times 5 gives you 15, so you factor it 15. But if I keep on increasing this number and add digits, then you will find it more and more difficult to answer this question. What are the prime factors? And if I keep on increasing the, the number of digits, the time it will take you grows exponentially. And you know, very fast, you know, I just, you have to, I add an extra digit, you have to double more or less the time it takes you to figure out what are the prime factor. Why is that? Well, the reason is that we don't have any good algorithm for factoring. In contrast, the, the, the reverse operation, multiplication, is, is easy. Um, in this case, you know, fast multiplication, the time just, if you increase the size of the numbers you have to multiply, then it just, you know, logarithmically you just grow the time uh, for doing this operation, but factoring is tough. Nobody knows whether it's tough inherently, because nobody managed to prove. There's no mathematician who managed to prove that factoring is really inherently difficult. It's simply not known, but you know, we know, for example, that if we, for quantum computers that operate on a different set of instructions, factoring it's not tough at all. So if we can design a quantum algorithm, we can find an efficient one for factoring. So that means, you know, yes, we can break public key crypto systems. It's tough, it's difficult, uh, but it's possible. And uh, especially with quantum computers. So the big, the big thing, if you want to, you know, uh, be known as, if you want to contribute big way to crypto, you may want to find a way of encrypting messages using similar tricks based on mathematical problem different than factoring that 
will be always difficult, even to quantum computers. This is a very tough problem. We don't know how to do it. We, there are some ideas how to do it. Some of my colleagues are working on this. But uh, you know, coming up with definite proof will be very, very difficult. So this is roughly the idea of public key crypto systems. And, uh, but let me now go into the quantum domain. So here is like, I, so far it was all about classical information and, uh, and how we deal with the security of classical information. By the way, you know, if you have any questions at any point, do ask. I hope it's clear so far. So, okay, so now let me bring a little bit of physics into this. And then I will just show you how the two combine. Um, so I'm going to now tell you something about the quantum crypto. So the, well, never mind the origin of quantum crypto. You know, the, um, the, the story actually goes to the beginning of quantum mechanics. And uh, as you perhaps know, the quantum theory was something that uh, was pretty much at the inception of quantum theory. There were already controversies, not so much about underlying mathematics, but about what it means. What is the, is it really, does it really describe reality? Or is it kind of, why doesn't, why doesn't it allow you to make precise predictions? Why is it of sort of, why sometimes you, you cannot say what's going to happen, you can only assign probabilities, and so on and so forth. And the person who was probably the most eminent physicist at the time in the 30s, in the 1930s, who was, um, you know, many, th many people thought, well, he was this grumpy old man, Albert Einstein, Princeton at the time, who was, who was always complaining about this, and, you know, the quantum physics is not good. Meanwhile, lots of young guys like Heisenberg, Schrodinger, and all those youngsters in Europe were just coming up with uh, new explanations about the atomic structure, about the molecules, explaining this and that using quantum theory. But Einstein was actually, you know, uh, at the time, he really thought very deeply about physics. And he, he was very unhappy about the way quantum theory was constructed. He, he was very unhappy about the fact that it doesn't make precise predictions, that it's kind of a little bit fuzzy. And, uh, and, and he was coming up with all kinds of ideas showing that it doesn't make much sense, that it has to be, it's only phenomenological, that it's only provisional, that there will be a better, more precise explanation how things work at the atomic level. He couldn't come up with any constructive way, but he was at least trying to show that there are some, if you take quantum physics seriously, then there are certain consequences. And those cons consequences were, in his view, sort of deep and profound, and just like even questioning the existence of underlying reality. And um, so probably the most famous paper along those lines that Einstein wrote, it was in 1935, um, was this paper written together with uh, Nathan Rosen and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Boris Podolsky. And in that, that, that is known as the EPR paper, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, where they basically took quantum physics and, uh, and showed that if you take it seriously, then you can question something that Einstein called the, um, the element of reality, which he thought like the, the physical property that does exist, that can be measured, and should have some kind of ontological existence. So Einstein was very, very firm on believing that Whatever physical theory we have, it has to correspond to, it has to describe reality. It doesn't describe your perception of reality. It describes underlying reality full stop. So he was a realist and he was very firm on this. And he was saying that, you know, if you take it seriously, there may be situations where you cannot really assign numerical values to, 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 to those elements of reality. I'll try to explain this a little bit. I don't go into all the details. But in sort of a modern version, think about it this way. Take, for example, a certain property of an object like a photon. You know, a photon is a particle of light, and a photon would have properties that you can measure. One property that you can measure is polarization. In fact, there's no one polarization, but you can measure polarization of a photon along different directions. So you can put your polarizing filter at a certain angle, and you can ask the question, what is the polarization of this photon along this direction? And the answer is binary, either plus one or minus one in, say, units of h-bar. So, so it is uh, something that you can measure. There are devices that can measure, and there are two results. So think about it 
as a binary outcome of the measurement. So if you can measure polarization along any direction, it makes sense to ask the following question. Okay, so this photon, when it comes to this measuring device and you measure this polarization, does it have this particular polarization prior to the measurement? Then you say, yeah, sure. I mean, like what do measurements do? They kind of reveal pre-existing values, right? If I look at some object and it's, uh, you know, it's white, so this whiteness is, was there and I just look and discover that it was white. If I look at another, at your t-shirt, it's red, right? So it was red before you even walked into this room. I believe so, right? And uh, so it's not that it became out of the sudden red when I look at you. And uh, so, so we have this classical perception of reality where we think, okay, um, Act of observations, act of measurement, reveal pre-existing things. They do exist independently of our observations. And we just simply, when we do the measurements, observations, we, we discover what they are. Now, that's, let's, let's take this a little bit further and show that this may not be the case. So there are situations with polarizations that physicists can arrange today where you can see quite clearly that this is not the case. That thinking this way, that those polarizations along any direction was ever existed prior to the measurement, leads you to contradictions. So that, that doesn't look quite right. Um, and uh, now here's probably the, the most complicated slide that I have, so stay with me for this simple <laughs> mathematical equation. But this is like one slight introduction to something, the buzzword is Bell inequalities or Bell theorem. And it doesn't require more in terms of explanation than this one slide. So, so after Einstein, John Bell, who was um, a physicist from Northern Ireland, who was supposed to be working on, well, he was working at CERN on, 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 on designing accelerators. But after hours, he was thinking about the foundations of quantum physics. Today, he's mostly known for his contribution to the foundations of quantum physics. So that means, you know, to all of you, the message is, what you do after hours does matter sometimes, you know, maybe even more what is your daily job. Uh, and so, so he, he thought about this EPR paper, and he, in the modern language, he came up with this idea. Maybe I can actually design an experiment, at least Gedanken experiment, because Einstein left it at some kind of philosophical level. And then John Bell comes and says, well, this could be testable proposition, whether those values have pre-existing values, so to speak. So now imagine Alice and Bob. So let's introduce our characters, Alice and Bob. And so Alice will have a measuring device for polarization. And we ask Alice to choose between two different types of polarization. I call it A1 and A2. And for each incoming photon, she will be choosing randomly and independently from Bob to measure either A1 or A2. You know, if she picks up A1, she will be getting one of the two values, plus one or minus one. For A2, also plus one or minus one. And the same for Bob. He will pick up possibly two other polarizations. Let's call them B1 and B2. And B1 can have two different values, plus one or minus one. B2 can also have two different values, plus one and minus one. So now, suppose you know we have pairs of photons generated by, from, from somewhere, from a source. And one photon goes to Alice and one photon goes to Bob. And that corresponds roughly to some kind of experiment that Einstein had in mind, but in a slightly different language. Now, we assume that the measurements performed by Alice and Bob reveal pre-existing values. So assume that the, the photons you really have, A1 is defined, A2 is defined prior to the measurement. So A1, think about it as a random variable that has a predefined value before Alice picks it up via measurement. So, it, so the photon carries the value both A1 and A2 when it comes to this measuring device. One of them will be measured, but, but you know, nonetheless assume that the two of them are there and, uh, and she, Alice picks up one of those two values. And the same for Bob. So then, and that's sort of like modification of the Bell's argument, consider another random variable called S. This is a linear combination of A1, A2, B1, and B2. And look at this expression. 
if you look at this sort of, I have B1 plus B2 and B1 minus B2. So one of these terms has to be equal to, z is either zero and the other one plus minus two. Why is that so? Because, you know, if B1 and B2 do exist, so they have predetermined values, so they are either identical or not. So they could be identical, plus one, plus one, or minus one, minus one, or different. One could be plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, right? So if they are identical, then B1 minus B2 is going to be zero. And therefore, the other term will be either plus two or minus two, and vice versa. So it's very easy then to see that S can only get two different values, plus two or minus two. So, okay, so then Alice and Bob can estimate this value if they keep on performing those measurements the way I described to you. They pick up A1 or A2, B1 or B2, and many, many, many pairs of photons are distributed. So then they can later communicate in public, compare what they registered, and estimate the average value of S. So the average value of S will be, because S for each particular case is either plus two or minus two. So the average value will be somewhere between minus two and two, right? So if you have random variable and has two different values, minus two and two, if you average, you'll be somewhere in between, between minus two and two. Is this clear? Well, congratulations, you understand Bell inequalities now. So this is exactly the Bell inequality statement, saying that under normal assumptions, the average value of S has to be between minus two and two. This is called Bell inequality. If you want to be more precise, it's called CHSH inequality, but who cares? You know? So now, this is a testable proposition. You can run experiment. And you know, there's a beautiful story how people were trying to figure out what this value really is, because quantum physics, if you use quantum physics, it shows that actually quantum predictions for certain choices of A1, A2, B1, and B2 can give you values that are outside this range. In fact, if you were to use quantum predictions for some settings, you would go outside the interval minus two, two. You would go to you know, something that you can go even to two square root of two. And they, you know, people started experimenting. Not right away, but you know, um, Bell was, remember, Bell was doing this after hours. So when he published, most physicists said, Ugh, yeah, philosophy, who cares, you know? But, but you know, slowly, you know, people started looking into this because it was an interesting foundational question. And, and, and many experiments were actually at the very beginning not quite conclusive. But probably the most conclusive first experiment came from uh, this person here, Alain Aspect. If you know Alain, he's like a quintessential French physicist with a big mustache. He looks a little bit like Inspector Clouseau. And, uh, but he's a wonderful, you know, <laughs> wonderful person and a wonderful physicist because he was the first one who really considered this question seriously and performed probably the first really decisive measurement uh, of this value S. And when Alan did his, uh, when Alan published his results, most physicists were kind of um, converted in, in saying, well, first of all, that indeed this makes sense. And many people actually, even though you kind of believe what quantum theory tells you, were kind of shocked because, say, well, what does it mean then? You know, if, if Aspect is right, and Aspect is most likely right because many other experiments were performed later on by many other people and the most uh, probably Interesting and definite one was performed just only a couple of years ago by uh, Roland Hansen in, in, in Delft in, in the Netherlands, which actually showed that the Bell inequalities are violated. And it's, you know, in a way, it's one of the most important experiments in modern physics, because it tells you something deep and profound about reality. Unlike many experiments, when Alan was doing this, it was not quite clear whether he will see this violation of Bell inequalities or not. Some experiments that were performed prior to his experiment were inconclusive. The, the technology was not so good enough, you know, this, this pairs of photons that uh, had to be generated in a certain way were maybe a bit messy to see all those results, but, but he 
came up with a state of the art of the experiments. With today's technology, you can see the violation of Bell inequalities in the lab. In fact, you know, there are groups in OIST that if you if you're nice to Sheila, probably she can design something in the lab showing the violation of Bell inequalities here. So you can basically, you know, it can become like a standard thing today um, in, in, in a quantum optics lab. But at the same time, the consequences are really shocking. You know, and you know, it can actually, it's not so difficult to understand. I just gave you explanation in one transparency. The mathematics is trivial, but it's just interpretation. The, the fact that those values do not exist prior to the measurement is a bit shocking. So you cannot attribute values to A1, A2, B1, B2. Because if you, if you do, then you don't see any violation of Bell inequalities. We derived it, right? So, so there is something shocking about it. And you have to really just you know, digest it a few times over. And if you don't find it shocking, you probably have to think about it again. You know, it's, and then, you know, after a while, you just get used to it, and then most physicists of younger generation today say, well, yeah, it is, yeah, it is kind of cool. <laughs> and uh, so the next thing is, well, if this is so, can we use it for something interesting? And what is the connection between aspect experiment and what I was telling you about uh, security thing? Well, think about it. Uh, think about that any information that we deal with has to be encoded in physical properties of a certain object, right? So if I talk to you, this is acoustic wave. Uh, if you, you know, electrons, electromagnetic waves, you, there is a carrier of information. There's always physical carrier of information. So the, the big slogan in the community is, there's no information without physical representation of information. Just, it has to be the case. So how about if you use polarization of photon to encode your zeros and ones. You say, fine, okay, I can send information encoded in polarized photons. Um, this way, I, you know, one is one, minus one could be equal to zero in the binary alphabet, or you can, you know, you can send a one bit of information with the photon polarized along given direction. So how then uh, we can use ASPER experiment or violation of Bell inequalities for security of the key distribution. Well, the line of reasoning, and I, I will not go into uh, detail, but the line of thinking can be like this. So, so if it is, we just showed that in some cases when we see the violation of Bell inequalities, we cannot attribute numerical values to polarization of the photon prior to the measurement. So if this is the case, so those values somehow didn't exist prior to the measurement. They were not available. If they don't exist, nobody knows about them, right? So nobody touched those photons. Nobody had any prior knowledge what those values could be. Because if it were the case, someone could make those predictions what Alice and Bob can register, then the Bell inequalities, as you saw, would be wouldn't be violated. So given the violation of Bell inequalities, nobody really touched those polarizations. Nobody had a chance to disturb, to, 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 to learn what it is. So, or eavesdrop on this. So testing for, your, for the violation of Bell inequalities is equivalent to testing for eavesdropping. You see the violation of Bell inequalities, you know nobody actually messed up with polarization. That was pristine. That reached you without anyone having prior knowledge about it. You just, you know, you registered it, and the photons that would have predetermined values, you wouldn't see any violation of Bell inequality. So, so, so this uh, can then be used in uh, protocols which would allow you to distribute. You can now imagine a situation where you have a source of what is called entangled photons. I can show you the first experiment that I did with, well, I shouldn't say ID, John Rarity and Paul Tapster at uh, what used to be called Defense Research Agency in UK, in Malvern, did this experiment. The idea was, you know, generate photons, those pairs of photons, using a process that is called parametric down conversion. So you have a strong laser that heats the crystal, and this, uh, you know, atoms in the crystal got excited, and then it goes down into the ground state through some intermediate state, and and emits two photons in, in, in well-defined directions. And those two entangled photons then go um, into the Alice and Bob and they are measured. So you can see the, the crystal, you can see the, the, the PAM beam. Those down-converted beams is a bit of a cheating here because John and 
John Wright and Paul Tapps, they use the reference beam, so you, those are not really dumb converted photons, but for the purpose of the demonstration, you have this. So that was, you know, way back in 1990, and, and since then, um, the quantum crypto has took the world in all kinds of different ways, different places. Today, people employ all kinds of different types of quantum cryptography, not only the one that I showed you that is based on Bell inequalities, that is something that I worked on, but uh, two colleagues of mine, um, Charlie Bennett and Gilles Brassard, came up earlier and independently um, and with another idea how to do it. And uh, today, actually, both, even though the one that is based on Tangman has uh, a number of advantages, and I'm not just saying this because, you know, this is, <laughs> this is kind of my idea, but, but indeed, you can show that uh, the that has extra security features and is actually um, many extra capabilities. There's also, you may have heard about the Chinese quantum satellite issues. This is why quite remarkable that uh, you can actually have a quantum key distribution from the satellite to the ground station. And I think the experiments that they are working on uh, is uh, now just to send entangled photon really into two ground stations and use the scheme, the, the method that I just described to you, use it to, to generate the, the key between those two different ground stations. So, you know, so this is actually part of the story. Um, we started with Skittily. I talked about monoalphabetic ciphers, polyalphabetic ciphers, all broken, Enigma broken. Then public key crypto system, uh, you know, could be broken by quantum computer, depends uh, what we have. And then comes quantum crypto, and that quantum crypto is different because it doesn't rely on mathematical difficulty of some math unknown problems. That, you know, it's not the case that it, within, within a sort of mathematical security, the, the way we play with the computational security, computational complexity days of public key crypto systems, we, we think, okay, one day there may be a clever mathematician, perhaps one of you, you know, someone, who, who, who will find a way of breaking public key crypto system as we know them today, because it just would mean like finding efficient way of factoring large integers. But when you go to physics, it's a different kind of game. You are not talking about mathematical, there, there will be no clever physicists who can actually influence the laws of physics. You just discover them, but you cannot say, okay, well, I don't like this, maybe I can work on something and find a different law of physics. So it's a different kind of game. So you have a physical security, which, which gives you a, some different, and different type of security. Basically, as law as the laws of physics as they are, those, and no one can actually, you know, be above the laws of physics, you know, modular theological consequence you know, discussion. So nobody being beyond the laws of physics, you, you know, those systems are secure. And then there's even more to it that becomes even more wacky because, you know, I can give you a talk about quantum crypto as I gave you now, I would say a few years ago, I could give you the same talk, but it has been a remarkable progress. And the progress is that there are many interesting features that you can actually discover. First of all, that the source of photons, of those entangled photons, doesn't have to be protected in any way. So if you have it on satellite, you don't have to care about uh, someone hacking the satellite. If someone hacks the satellite, you will see it in the statistics. You will see the violation of Bell inequality. So somehow you don't have to worry about this. It's even more powerful than that. You can even, even if you are given devices that were somehow given to you by someone whom you don't trust, but you use those devices to see the statistics and violation of Bell inequalities, you can do reverse thinking that they can only come from genuine EPR source. So, so the, there are many things that were discovered by my colleagues later on after my work. Um, you know how it is. Sometimes when you come up with something, your ideas are more clever than you are. So, so somehow, you know, I had this feeling that, uh, that this idea, I, I couldn't see all the consequences of this idea. It's, it required, you know, a number of colleagues later on saying, ah, look, in interesting, you don't have to make this assumption. Or you can also weaken this assumption, and so on and so forth. So today, you know, we go into area which is called device-independent cryptography which basically means that we can even entertain a scenario where you buy equipment from someone whom you don't trust. And uh, without even trusting these people, you can establish secure key 
using um, the system that I described. So the statistics, which is uh, responsible, when you see the violation of the inequalities in any statistic, that is actually quite enough to guarantee a certain degree of security. So if you want to know more about it, there is a, a you know, semi popular or semi-technical, whichever way you want to talk about the review paper that I wrote with a colleague of mine, Renato Renner, which gives you sort of a scenario where we even analyze scenario, what if um, you don't have a free will? Now, don't get me wrong, I, we don't go into sort of a philosophical debate there, but we consider situations where how Alice and Bob make those random choices between A1, A2, and B1, and B2. Because we made this tacit assumption that they choose randomly, right? But what does it really mean randomly? And what if you get a random generator from someone whom you don't trust? Can you use this random generator from your enemy? So it turns out that, you know, that as long as this random generator gives you a certain degree of randomness, you can still establish a secure key. But I will, that, you know, that would go a little bit beyond uh, the, the topic of this. So, you know, this is actually, to end the whole story, I took you from Asian Greeks, uh, just about everything in Europe starts with the Asian Greeks, and uh, through uh, Romans and to um, polyalphabetic ciphers, then to um, one time path that we know that is secure, I identified the key distribution problem, and then I showed you how mathematicians try to solve it in a beautiful way using some number theory and mathematical problems and how physicists approach this. And uh, I uh, should say that uh, it's probably not the end of the story because even though quantum crypto is, is, is a solid experimental physics today and engineering and its commercial proposition that are companies that are actually selling quantum key distribution devices, it still has those sort of more adventurous cryptography, the fringes of data security are still pretty much basic research. And, and it's beautiful because, you know, you, you talk about subject that seems to be of practical value, but nonetheless, it touches deep questions, the notion that nature of reality, is it deterministic or not, the notion of causality, even free will, if you want. And uh, now, I put one slide at the very end, uh, which is, but then I realized that probably giving my last lecture here, I already showed this slide and give you this puzzle. So I think I spoiled the whole thing, but, um, but nonetheless, let me show it to you. So, so the way I want to usually illustrate um, the fact that physicists has a role, have a role to play is by, by this puzzle that, uh, that I will describe to you and I'll give you the answer, no worries. So, so here is a puzzle. You are here in front of two doors, two doors leading to two different rooms. In one room, you have three switches. In the other room, you have three old-fashioned light bulbs. And um, you know that the, the switches are all in, in position off at the very beginning. And you know that there's one-to-one -one correspondence between the light bulbs and the switches here. But you don't know what it is. Now, you can enter each room, but you can enter each room only once. And once you leave the room, you're not allowed to go back to the same room, okay? Then your task is to figure out what is this one-to-one -one correspondence. Is it possible? And then if you're a mathematician, if you think in abstract terms, you say, no, it's not possible. I can prove it to you, it's not possible. And how would you prove? Well, say, okay, it only makes sense to go to this room with the switches first, right? And then you can, for example, take the first switch, put it in position on, leave the room, go to the other one. You see that one light bulb is on, but there's ambiguity about the other two, which are off, so you don't know. And then, you know, if you were, for example, to put two switches in position on, there will be ambiguity about the two light bulbs that are on. So you can look at all different things that you can do, and you say, well, Whatever I do, there will be always ambiguity, either about the two light bulbs which are off or two light bulbs which are on. So, so QED, I cannot do it, so it's impossible. But you know, give this puzzle to a physicist who is uh, on, inclined to experimental physics and to engineers. You know, engineers will say, yeah, what's the problem? I just, sure, you can do it. 
So you have to think about this as for real. It's not an abstract thing. This is a physical thing. This is just something that is really for real. Don't use mathematical abstraction. Use everything that you have to your advantage. Think of, as a physicist. So you go to this room first, right? Put one switch in position on. Go to the second switch. Put it on, say, for 10 minutes. Switch it off. You go to the other room. One light bulb is on. It's, the other one is still warm, right? And then the other one is off. So, so you see that you use heat dissipation because it's a real thing for the thing. So, so you solve this problem. As a physicist, you solve the problem. And so this is exactly what happened to uh, the area of uh, secure communication, but also to computation. When people realize that this is not a mathematical model. Those physical, the computers are physical devices. The same goes for those security things. You know, those are physical devices. Now, what you can tell about those devices is not mathematics that is telling you. We, we have a pretty good theory of information, which is mathematical. It tells you about channel capacities. It tells you about security. But this means nothing if it doesn't conform to underlying physics. As it happened, you know, that the founders of computer science somehow captured the underlying physical theory. So they just they understood this classical physics well enough to translate it into abstract mathematical model for information. But it doesn't have to be the case. Every single time you discover something new, so you discover quantum physics, right? Quantum phenomena, like heat dissipation here. So then you can use it to your advantage. So that's the reason why, if you take it as a physical process, you can see that this actually brings you, you can take advantage of this. In the same way, you can take advantage of a heat dissipation to solve this problem, which otherwise, in mathematical terms, is not solvable. So that's, that's how physicists enter this game. And you know, so that means that sometimes thinking in terms of a real physical process gives you lots of advantage. Not always, you know, sometimes it's, it's good to have a mathematical abstraction to tackle most, you know, to focus on what is relevant in a given problem. But, but if there is a moral to the story is information is physical, we better use all we know about underlying physics to process information. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Arthur, for a very insightful and uh, easy to follow uh, seminar. Uh, even a molecular biologist could follow, but I'm very happy <laughs> that you explained at the end the difference between a mathematician and a physicist. I have to remember. Any questions to Arthur? Well, so either I made it so clear or so difficult. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it has nothing to do with your red shirt. Sorry to pick you up. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's perfectly uh, fine. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture, Professor Eckhart. Um, um, the question is kind of, I guess, please excuse me if it's stupid. But, oh, there's no stupid um, question. There are stupid answers, but not stupid questions. <laughs> it's just, I still can't wrap my head around why say an eavesdropper couldn't potentially um, intercept a message, but then re-encode it, like spoofing a message in a sense, to intercept it and then qu quantumly, again, re-encode the message. What, what would prevent that from happening? What, what about this uh, setup uh, right. prevents that from happening? Right, so, so um, in this scenario, we can, you can e think about it well, to a short answer to your question is because even if the person, an eavesdropper, were to generate those photons and send it to Alice and Bob, still, for Alice and Bob to see violation of Bell inequalities precludes any knowledge of uh, an eavesdropper to, to, to knowing the values. So you can think about the key distribution that I described, imagine the following scenario, that it is an eavesdropper that gives one photon to Alice and one photon to Bob. So just forget about intercept, you know, just assume this scenario. So the claim is that even under this assumption, Alice and Bob can know whether an eavesdropper is giving blindly those values without knowing what they are, or an eavesdropper knows what the values are. 
If the eavesdropper knows what the values are, then the Bell viol inequalities will not be violated. So the best, if you see the violation, that means that even if the eavesdropper is controlling the source, it's controlling in such a way that it doesn't measure, it, 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 he is not or she is not measuring polarization of, this, of those photons. Because any act of interference with this would, re, would be revealed. So it's, it's, it's kind of, um, so, so you can assume the situations where basically extreme scenario, you ask an, the enemy to distribute photons to Ellis and Bob, it still works. It's still the violation of Bell inequalities means, okay, the eavesdropper gave you the photons, but he doesn't know what was he giving you. Still the values are secret. We're not known to him. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I fully agree that if you measure the polarization, and then you will destroy the entanglement and uh, the two things become uncorrelated completely. But what about the weak measurements? Can I not just slowly leach a bit of information, slowly, slowly, until I get <laughs> yeah, something yeah, interesting? Yeah, no, of course. So, so the, um, yes, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. So it doesn't have to be, you know, the, the, the weak measurement, you mean like a gentle, you, you know, you have partial information about it, right? Not extreme information. So indeed, in my talk, just for educational purposes, I... I assume two uh, extreme scenarios, either perfect eavesdropping or no eavesdropping at all. But in reality, you may, basically your question in trans is translated into the following. Okay, you know that the Bell inequality, you know, the violation is you see somewhere between minus two and two. Quantum mechanically, you go from minus two square root of two to two square root of two. So. If it is two square root of two, there's a perfect violation of Bell inequalities, no information leaked to eavesdropper. If it is beyond two, let's operate on positives, is beyond two, we can assume that an eavesdropper has a perfect knowledge. What about somewhere between two and two square root of two, if you do the weak measurement? So there's like, so, so the answer to your question is we can handle cases like this. And the way we do it is we assume we look at the degree of the violation of Bell inequalities, how much above two it is, how much about where it is. Knowing the value of, the, of, the, of this S figure of merit that I was showing, we can estimate how much information could have leaked to the eavesdropper. And then computer scientists have a technique which is called privacy amplification. If you know, if you can put an upper bound on the amount of information that someone has about the key, there's a classical technique to reduce the key a little bit, but erase this information. So this is uh, called privacy amplification. And to give you the gist of the idea, let, let me give you a simple example. Suppose um, I know, suppose you have two bits of information, you know, two bits. And uh, so somehow, you know, and I, I you know, that I know one of them. But you don't know whether I know the first bit or the second bit. But you know that the, you put the upper bound. You know that I cannot know more than one bit of information. Can you do something to have a secret? What you can do, you can do the binary addition between those two, right? And you have now reduced the value. You had two bits, now you have one bit. But you're for sure that I have no idea what it is, right? Regardless whether I knew what was the value of the first bit or the second bit, you don't care. By doing this modular addition, you reduce my information to zero. So this is the, uh, the essential idea about the privacy amplification. There are mathematical techniques that given the partial, you put the upper bound of the knowledge, you can reduce the size of the key and then erase the information of eavesdropper basically to as small amount as you want. So my question is a little bit sneaky here. Uh, what about exploring um, a distance for measuring the effervescent field so that you get a time delay in the copying of the... Can it really destroy the message at a larger distance if you record the effervescent field of the photon? Mm. 
So you mean like uh, you, what you have in mind is like I just you send polarization in optical fibers, right? And you try to measure uh, the field um, outside the fiber. But you do it at the distance. So even though it's very weak, maybe. Uh huh. I don't know that problem, but uh, then there would be a time delay. Um, so you mean to 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 detect eavesdropper using the time delays? Yes, you can do it as well. So, but that that actually would be, you know, okay. If you do it this way, uh, you can add it as as an extra tool to picking up the noise. But if you're really um, good at eavesdropping, you try not to introduce the time delays, right? You would like to perform this measurement and keep the photon within a given sort of uh, uh, time uh, time bin, so to speak. There are techniques of using what is called time bin entanglement. So it doesn't have to be polarization. It can be placing a photon in a given time window, where those kind of techniques can be used for eavesdropper. Yes. Okay, two, two more questions, and then we wrap it up. Here, 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 here. It has been shown that pairs of entangled photons, when they are separated, they, this can be done over a fairly large distance, over fiber optics or even over satellites. Isn't that the perfect key distribution mechanism? The pair of entangled photons? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that. I think, you know, of course, um, it is, so that was actually is that uh, because that, that somehow amplifies uh, what I was saying, right? So, so that the problem, of course, is it is there is a bit of a decoherence and there are some issues, um, but um, but you know the, the, the experimental challenge is uh, to find a good way of distributing the keys in the telecom wavelength. So we are talking about you know 1.3, 1.5 microns. Um, but, you know, when when you go to the atmosphere, you have to think how to do it. What is the most optimal way of doing this? There are, when you do it from the satellite, there are always losses because of the atmosphere. And then the big thing is, of course, you know, the refractive index, the size of your optics, for example, on the ground, because this photon can be deflected easily in some direction. So there are many experimental challenges. The, the main problem with quantum crypto is actually that it's mostly tuned to the key distribution at the moment. But uh, as, as I said, cryptography today is about many other things, about uh, securing signatures, authentication, and many other topics, you know. Um, uh, what, if you look at the Bitcoin, for example, or blockchain, there's the whole underlying classical crypto that is there. And it's not an, an necessarily clear how we can use quantum phenomena, how difficult or how easy would that be to have a quantum substitute for this. In fact, we know that the quantum crypto will not solve all the problems. So in the future, we'll be probably looking for some hybrid systems where you may use quantum crypto for the key distribution if you want to say, suppose you have two data centers and you want to correlate, correlate classified information between two data centers which are far away. So quantum crypto is very good for it. But to do any other things like uh, Digital signatures, we wouldn't necessarily know how to do it with the quantum thing. So, so, so yeah, so the entangled photons are great for this and they, they're good, but, uh, but there are some technological and conceptual limitations. So I'm not saying that, you know, I, would, I don't want to give you sort of a thing, you know, we found the holy grail, everything is clear, you know, the paradise, now every, everyone goes quantum and that's it. In fact, if you talk to people working for government agencies, they recognize over time, you know, they learn to recognize that quantum is the issue or a solution. But most of them wouldn't be sort of jumping up and down saying that solution to everything. You know, the engineers still think that, you know, conventional crypto has to go on and so on and so forth. So, it's, you know, quantum is a tiny fraction growing and important. And if you look at the sort of NSA, they really concern about the advances in quantum technology. But I wouldn't say that this is like the mainstream, certainly not. Um, I like this idea. Um, um, so whenever I read article on the quantum mechanics like this, I have a headache because 
Oh, you're not the only one. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Um, headache is because uh, I do not believe the existence of photons. Okay. So, so then yeah. you can. Uh, how, do you believe in the existence of neutrons? Yeah. No. Um, uh, how about protons? Uh, in 1932, there was a discussion, mm -hmm. um, Copenhagen interpretations, and I read many times and digested. I concluded that a photon doesn't exist, but mm -hmm. the photon, name of the photons is a kind of abstraction of the phenomena. Yeah, yeah. Okay? But that's okay. So even yeah. uh, even if you take this view, it, it doesn't actually. It's entirely up to you. So, so you know, you have to sure. explain somehow how those cliques in detectors are generated, okay? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, most people would just say there's a carrier and there's uh, photons. Yeah. Um, but you don't have to, actually, for the purpose of security and, and my talk, you don't even have to believe in the existence of photons. Yeah, but the problem is, whenever I read entanglement papers, articles, I can find the problem associated with a particle wave duality. If you, if you read every article without photons, we, we come up the different answers always. Yeah? So um, are you saying that? For example, huh? yeah. in this case, maybe it's uh, some, the wave or light propagating through the vacuum. It is a continuous always. The interpretation said that, not me. The interpretation said this, okay. then the, there, there is no photons. Okay. Yeah. The photon phenomena happens when you observe. It's knocking like a ball, shooting the wall, it makes a sound of ball. But when you detect the photons, it comes out, the energy is quantized. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so, so, yeah. so I may have only two comments to your, to your, uh, to your question or statement. Uh, comment number one is that um, People who take this um, wave approach, you know, um, uh, thinking about the wave function, and uh, when it comes to entanglement, quite often mm -hmm. they don't realize that those are having two particles or whatever. Yeah. If I, you know, they, the, the, this wave is actually in some configuration mm -hmm. space. It doesn't correspond to yeah. two corresponding waves. So. If I may use the language of photons, single photon or single particle phenomena are easy to explain by using wave particle duality. But if you start having more, then you are getting into big problems right away because uh, you, you cannot think that those waves exist in, in, in the real space as a separate waves. That's one comment. But, but I understand you're aware of this. So that's, but the second thing is, for the, purpose, the beauty of this, especially device independent thing, is the following. Whatever it is that generates the cliques, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, it could be spooky action at the distance. It could be photons. Whatever your explanation is, to explain the statistics, you have to deny third party having access to any predetermined values to whatever you register. So this can be shown regardless underlying physics. So that's why, you know, uh, you may not believe in photons, but I think at least I can persuade you that this is secure, So, which is good enough as far as I'm concerned. That is acceptable, he says. All right, so th I think let's give him a big hand in order to thank him for a wonderful <laughs> seminar.